Thank you, ladies. Our scripture this morning, a continuation of our seven church, seven churches study, is from Revelation 2, verses 18 and 19. Revelation 2, verses 18 and 19. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. We'll turn the time over now to Pastor Gary. So this church is an improving church. Its works are greater now than they were at the beginning. So isn't that great news? Well, we got to hear the rest of the story, of course. But we'd like to think of us as a growing church, as an improving church. So maybe we ought to pay attention to this message as well. Now, remember, each of the seven churches, it says at the end, he who has ears to hear let them hear what the, or what the message is to the uh, churches. So it's a message for everyone. Now, not every detail may apply to every person, but we ought to pay attention at least. So this is to the seven churches, especially the Thyatira church. Now, of course, to understand these messages, the key to understanding is to look at the other Bible verses, and we'll be doing that. And we'll let John, of course, he's the one who wrote all of this down. Thyatira is this place right there. It's up toward the north, it's quite inland, and there's nothing really terribly exciting about this church. It's, um, you know, in the bigger scale of things, it's right there in Turkey. Here's an old, old picture of what it was, and there wasn't an awful lot of it left. There's a little bit of ruins you can see. Um, the city has grown up around the ruins. So it, it really was a real church. The message applies to this church, and it applies to us today as well. It starts off with this, write this letter to the angel of the church in Thyatira. This message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire and whose feet are like polished bronze. I'm going to have to get my different glasses. So much better. You know, with bifocals, you can read close up and you can see things far away. Well, computer glasses are important as well because I'm missing that middle distance. So his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. Now, this is not addressed to any of the other churches, but for Thyatira, having eyes like Flames of fire means God knows what's going on. He can see their every action. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. In other words, God not only sees what's going on, he will act for what's important and going on as well. So that's important to realize that God is watching and he cares and he will act. You know, we send lots of requests his way. And you think, well, you know, maybe it'll happen. Well, God is interested in every single prayer. And he knows the best way to answer that. Toward the end of Revelation in chapter 19, then I saw heaven opened, a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful 
and true. You can count on him. He always gets it right. He judges fairly. He wages a righteous war. God is interested in doing war. Yes, he's had an awful lot of wars in the past. But it's a righteous war. He wants righteousness to succeed. And he's going to destroy the works of the devil. His eyes were like flames of fire. That same message shows up again. On his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He knows. You know, names are very descriptive of who the person is. Nobody quite understands everything about Jesus, but he knows, and he is very capable. He wore a robe dipped in blood. His title was the Word of God. Obviously, we know who that is because Jesus is the one who that has to be. In Daniel 10, 6, his body looked like a precious gem, his face flashing like lightning, his, aim, his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Very similar description, isn't it, to what we have in Revelation. So this description in Daniel and the description in Revelation for the church of Thyatira, it's similar. It takes the same kind of God, the God who will help the needs there in Thyatira. He has many descriptions. And the description for each church is different because Jesus has a different, he's needed differently for each church. And also, you know that he can fulfill our needs as well. He says, I know all the things you do. Those eyes of flame, they see what's going on. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance. All these are good. I can see your constant improvement in all these things. The works are greater now than they were at first. This church is doing quite well. And you think, well, <laughs> what more can we say? You know, this is great. The problem is the message doesn't stop there. Jeremiah it says, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. Then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. I will bring you home again. Isn't that what we're looking for? That God will bring us home again? Of course, we've not been there yet, but we've dreamed of it. We've talked about it. We've read the promises about it. Yes, I will bring you home again. Well, the captivity, it was 70 years. Most of the people had died who had gone into captivity. But I'll tell you what, we're not talking about individuals here. We're talking about the group. And we are God's group. We are the people that he has chosen to give us a particular message. And so he wants to bring us home. Well, I always enjoy going home. Um, go away on a trip. Maybe the trip is interesting and fun. Maybe it's a business trip, whatever it is always good to come home. Well, that's what God wants for us. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. God always wants the best for us. We don't always agree with his ideas, but I'll tell you what, if we would get on his page and understand what he wants to do for us, we'd get really excited. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Well, there's been many attempts by people. Well, I prayed, nothing happened. Well, did you do it wholeheartedly? Were you um, consistent, persistent in your prayers to him? When you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. That's a promise. You can count on that. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity, restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. This is the land that God himself picked out, the land of milk and honey. He said there is no other land in the whole world better than this. Well, that's where he wants to take each one of us as well. 
Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and he told me to say, This is what the Lord says to the people of Israel. I know what you are saying, for I know every thought that comes into your minds. Now, isn't that kind of scary? <laughs> Some of the thoughts that we think, oh, God somehow tuned in. He's connected. Um, if we would only think of that, maybe we'd think twice about some of our thoughts, some of the things that we uh, consider uh, doing, some of the things that we uh, kind of go over in our minds about what we think would be nice. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will judge all people according to their deeds. Now, we've talked about this before. It's in the same message, some of the same messages to the other churches judged according to your deeds. It's not judged according to your certificates on the wall. It's not judged according to your educational attainment. It's not judged according to what you wish would happen. Neither it is judged according to what you believe. It's what you do. It's when you act on that belief that is important. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. Well, this is a story about, you know, they saw Jesus uh, feed the 5,000. They participated in that. And they said, wow, we'd like to do this kind of stuff ourselves. Wouldn't that be great? Invite the people over, not having any food in the house or very little, and then be able to provide a banquet for everybody. If you like barley bread, if you like fish, that's what Jesus provided. What should we do to do God's works? Jesus told them this is the only work God wants from you. Here it is. This is the only thing he wants. And that is believe in the one he has sent. Now you say, well, doesn't that counteract just what you got through saying? It's more than belief? I'll tell you what. The whole definition of believe is acting on the belief. Well, I believe. Well, why aren't you doing something? Well, isn't belief enough? No, it's not. You've got to act on it. Or your belief is nothing. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Well, there's Jesus. Same book, a few chapters later, is explaining. Yes, you got to believe. That's the only thing I want you to do. But if you do believe, and since you believe, you got to do the same works I have done. And even greater works, because I'm going to be with my Father. Well, if he's going to be with his Father, he's sending the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to give us that power to be able to do these things. Well, we're without excuse. I mean, our belief has got to be a wholehearted belief. You know, just like when we seek the Lord with our whole heart, we'll find him. Well, when we believe with our whole heart, we'll be able to do what he's asked us to do. Titus 2 says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. There have not been a greater wealth of sinful pleasures out there. Media has provided that opportunities. There wasn't a lot of sinful pleasures when you're working on a farm and your nearest neighbor was a mile away and your transportation was a horse and a buggy and it was a lot of work to do that. Town was maybe uh, five, ten miles away. Well, today we've got media right in our pockets. We've got media in our living room and bedroom and sometimes people have it in their bathroom as well. People have this everywhere, and they have to make some choices, and they need to be good choices. God says, turn from godless living. Well, what's the difference between godless living and godlike living? Well, there's quite a bit, actually. We should live in this evil world with wisdom righteousness, devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to the wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. Because when he is revealed, what's the next thing that happens? We go on a trip. 
And this trip is to that promised home that he is going to give us. Well, that is what we need to do. So how should we live? Well, with wisdom, understanding just what God's word says and means, and with righteousness, the right doing, devotion to God, worship him, and looking forward to the hope. Well, that's not a complicated series of things, but I'll tell you what, the world has quite a grasp on a, quite a number of us. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us his very own people, totally committed to what? Doing good deeds. And, you know, you say, well, we're not saved by works. That's right, we're not. We're saved by God's grace. We're saved by the death of Jesus Christ. That's always been true. But what's our response to that? Oh, we can do whatever we want. No, you've got to believe. And you've got to have your actions doing the same actions that God has asked you to do. I mean, that's the trouble from the very beginning. God's word was this and Eve had another idea because she was deceived. And it's easy to be deceived by what the world has to say. There are authorities out there. Well, not all these authorities really give truth. Deceitfulness. It makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. I don't care what your church attendance is. I don't care if you attend prayer meeting or not. It'd be better if you did. But what's important is keeping God's commands, what he's asked us to do. I have this complaint against you. You knew it was coming, right? You're improving in all these different ways, but there is a little problem here. And it turns out it's quite a big problem. You are permitting, didn't say you were uh, thinking about, it says you are permitting that woman, that Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. You're allowing it. You're not just saying, nope, not allowed here. This is off base for you. No, you are permitting that to happen. So in what ways are we doing that? Well, let's read a little further. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and eat food offered to idols. Well, you know, can't we choose for ourselves what we want? I mean, science now says it's good. It's good to have variety. It's good to do this. Well, these authorities are against God's word. And if these authorities are against God's words, these authorities are liars. Got to put it plainly. These authorities are not your authorities because your authority is God. And that needs to be put very plainly. And to eat food offered to idols, what big deal is that? Well, tell you what. Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight even more than any of the kings before him. He wasn't surpassed until Manassas came along. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, remember Jeroboam who set up a golden calf at the southern part of the, uh, Israel's kingdom and a golden calf at the northern part, and he insisted that nobody go to Jerusalem. That would be a bad influence. You've got to worship in your own country. You've got to be supportive of your own country. You've got to be supportive of the gods that he has set up. Well, that loyalty is misguided. Well, that's not enough to do the same thing that Jeroboam was doing. He also married Jezebel. Well, Jezebel's got a pretty bad reputation. Uh, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, he began to bow down in worship of Baal. Well, what does Baal look like? There's hundreds of different things of Baal. This is one of them. Baal is usually a ox or a cow or a bull of something like that. And the whole idea of worshiping Baal 
And in almost every case, it's a fertility god. Well, if you want your crops to grow, if you want your wheat to grow, it takes fertility. Well, if you want your sheep to have lots of lambs, if you want your cows to have lots of calves, it takes fertility. And so you pray to the fertility god, which is Baal. And you know what Baal means? It means God. So it's a false god granted. And instead of the god who creates everything, the god who provides all our needs, they're very specifically worshiping a god who can only make them richer, provide for their pleasures and needs. So who's Baal? Well, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but basically it says he's a god of rain, thunder, fertility, and agriculture. And only the priests were able to have that special connection and say his name. But basically, Baal means God. Go and serve your idols, every one of you. But afterward, you will surely listen to me. And no longer profane my holy name with your gifts and idols. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. This is the start. He started things going. Then he set up an Asherah pole. Well, what's an Asherah pole? He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any other kings of Israel before him. Well, here's a picture of an Asherah pole. Well... They're usually made out of wood. They'd get some tall tree, and it looks something similar to what we now call a totem pole. Well, it's the same idea. We're worshiping a pantheon of gods because all these gods need to provide what we need instead of worshiping the one God who will provide all of our needs. Well, is this a um, Asherah pole? Is this uh, something similar? Who set this up? Well, it happens to be an obelisk. And it's all written in Egyptian language. Can you read that, Mel? <laughs> Maybe his brother can read a little bit. I, I don't know. But where is this? Who set this up? Well, there's actually two of these things. And they are set up in the Catholic Rome, the church. It's something, I don't know if they worship it, but why are they having it at the center of their worship as well? So Baal was the male fertility god. The Asherah pole was the female fertility god. And here it is right there in the center of Catholic worship as well. This happens to be right near the uh, church is called the mother of all the churches in the world. I've got a slide later that I'll show you that. Let's get back to Ezekiel or uh, back to um, what scripture says about idols. As for you, O people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Go right ahead and worship your idols. Sooner or later, you will obey me. You'll find out that worshiping these idols isn't going to do you any good. The same way is a lot of the things that this world provides for us. We think, well, this will be our salvation. This will help us. This will help us get along with society. And we find out it was empty. All these promises, they're empty. You know, these uh, electronic gadgets when I was a kid, they were just coming out. The music that we could listen to, that would just be it, right? Well, it wasn't. It was temporary pleasure at best. And then along comes uh, some of these movies. And you watch this movie, it'll be so uh, wonderful and it'll be so teaching you all kinds of good stuff. And you watch it and never good enough, not satisfied. Well, you will stop bringing shame on my holy name by worshiping idols. That's what God wants. He doesn't want a mixture of uh, idol worship in our lives. There's only one true God. For on my holy mountain, the great mountain of Israel, says the sovereign Lord, the people of Israel will someday worship me, and I will accept them. 
They've been away. They've done all this sin. But you know what? God forgives. God wants them back. There I will require that you bring me all your offerings and choice gifts and sacrifices. Why? Because he wants you. And those things that you think are important, if you give them to him, your life can be changed. When I bring you home from exile, you will be a pleasing sacrifice to me. I will display my holiness through you as all the nations watch. Then when I have brought you home to the land, I promise with a solemn oath. And when God makes a solemn oath, he wants you to understand you can count on it. To give to your ancestors, you will know that I am the Lord. You will look back on all the ways you defiled yourselves. And you will hate yourselves because of the evil you have done. <laughs> yeah. You know, many times I've been embarrassed when I think back. I chose that? What was I thinking? Yes, you're going to hate yourselves because of the evil you have done. And you will know that I am the Lord, O people of Israel, when I have on excuse me, when I have honored my name by treating you mercifully in spite of your wickedness. Well, you know, you say, well, where's the justice in that? Well, it's called grace. This is something God loves us so much. All you have to do is start to come back and he's got his arms open. He'll give you a big hug. Welcome back. And you'll, and you'll say, well, I, 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 I'm sorry. Well, Jesus says, I forgive. Tell you what, this is the plan. I've got good plans for you. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. I gave her time to repent. God gives us each time to repent. But for Jezebel, she does not want to turn away from her immorality. And if we are stuck on thinking that the world's pleasures are the key to our happiness, we need to think again. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Well, he doesn't want them to be destroyed, but, you know, he's going to have to destroy the cancer in this society. He's going to have to destroy the evil that keeps getting bigger. He wants everyone to repent. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, also to the Gentiles, that all must repent of their sins, turn to God, and prove they have changed. How do we prove we've changed? By our life, by the good things they do. Repent of their sins, prove that they have changed. Okay. Yes, I'm afraid that when I come again, God will humble me in your presence. And I will be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. You're still hanging on, but I like this. This gives me pleasure. Well, God's got something so much better. Give it up and he can show you. You have not repented of your impurity, your sexual immorality, and eagerness for lustful pleasure. It sounds like Thyatira people, doesn't it? Well, it sounds like many of our people today. Therefore, tell the people of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, repent and turn away from your idols. Stop all your detestable sins. They don't seem detestable to us, do they? But to God, they certainly are. And if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins. But you will have saved yourselves. The righteous behavior of the righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin. So if you're doing good, great. But if you turn to sin, you're going to lose everything. Nor will the wicked behavior of the wicked people destroy them if they repent and turn from their sins. So if you've had a wicked past. I'm sorry. But if you turn from your sins. It won't destroy you. God will save you. So it doesn't matter what your past. Whether it's good or bad. What matters is. Where are you now? Are you with the Lord? Have you 
full confidence in him? Are you looking forward to all his promises? Are you doing what he has asked you to do? Revelation 2.23, we're back to this message. I will strike her children dead. Well, who is that? Those who continue after the sins of Jezebel. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. There are going to be some accountability here. You do wrong, there will be some consequences. And I will teach, or excuse me, I will give each of you whatever you deserve. Doesn't say I will give each of you whatever you desire. He says I will give whatever you deserve. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not to please ourselves, not to please other people. You know, there's a term, people pleasers. Well, some people are like that. They'll say whatever they think other people want them to hear. They'll do whatever they think other people want them to do just to make them happy. Well, that needs to be God that we need to um, please because he alone examines the motives of our hearts. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time, before the Lord turns, because we are all a work in progress. Progress. Only God knows what's in our hearts, what's in our minds. He will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. They may look good, but God knows what's really going on. And God will give to each one whatever praise is due. It's shameful even to talk about the things the ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. When's that light come? Well, when Christ comes, it all is plain. Also, I have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. This false teaching of Jezebel that it's all right, it's okay, it'll probably be healthy. No, it's not healthy. Deeper truths that they call them, depths of Satan, actually. Well, sort this out. It's called healthy, it's called good for you, it's called wonderful. In actuality, it's just a part of Satan's plan of deception. Isn't that what affected Eve too? It's beautiful, it's delicious, it's going to make me wise? No. It's the depths of Satan, and she fell for it. I will ask nothing more of you except, here we go, are you paying attention? That you hold tightly to what you have until I come. Well, they're already improving, great. Stay away from Jezebel's message. Stay away from the idea that the world has some answers that God doesn't have. No, none of that. Hold tightly to what you have until I come. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. He says, everything I get, all my inheritance, you get to sit with me on my throne. It's yours as well. That's a great promise. There are false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Got to beware, got to know God's word. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. Yes, when he died for your sins, he purchased you so that you can have life. And people will deny him. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching, shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. More than ever are people saying, well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is just so restricted. The message is, that's 100 years old, 150 years old. We don't need to pay attention to that anymore. We need to get up to speed with the modern world. <laughs> no, no, that's part of the deception that is out there. The way of truth doesn't change. God's salvation doesn't change. His commitment to watch over us and turn us to him doesn't change. 
In their greed, they'll make up clever lies to get a hold of your money. Have you ever thought that's what's going on? It certainly is. Well, where your heart is, or where your treasure is, well, that's what you've got to be careful about. God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. The destruction, the consequences will happen. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod, smash them like clay pots. It sounds like violence to me, isn't it? Well, what in the world is this iron rod? You know, only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, your whole earth as possession. You will break them with an iron rod, smash them like clay pots. Same thing as it says here in Psalms. But what does it mean? You know, an iron rod doesn't move, doesn't bend, doesn't crack, doesn't split, doesn't do any of those things. God's word is solid. Doesn't change, doesn't break, doesn't let you down. It is solid. Well, when God's word, God's commandments are so firm, yes, it's going to do some damage because people don't want to listen to that. Later in Revelation, Revelation 12, she gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon, was caught up to God and his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her. 1260 days. Times were going to get tough. But God had a plan to care all during the Dark Ages. Well, that same Dark Ages is the Thyatira period, the Dark Ages. And we'll look at that in just a moment. From his mouth came a sharp sword. Strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. In other words, his word does not change. You can count on it. Always have. It's the same word that began in the beginning. And it's the same word that will guide us home now. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his side was written this title, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So that message not only applied back then, it applied during the Dark Ages, and it applies to us today. One day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority. Cast out all demons, heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God to heal the sick. Well, he still asks us to do that. He will give us power and authority to do that. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright and morning star. Well, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira. Well, we have some times that the message seems to fit especially well the time, the history of the Christian church. Well, the Thyatira period is the longest of them. Uh, more than a thousand years from 538 to 1565. So James Wary, who was a uh, authority on church history, said Christianity became the established religion in the Roman Empire, took on the place of paganism, took the place of paganism. Cre creation as is existed in the Dark Ages must be termed baptized paganism. Well, do we have anything different today? Don't we have a lot of baptized paganism by the way um, many act? Well, this church right here, and there's a little message. I've, my wife and I visited this church there in Rome, and it has this little message right there on the church. And it says, uh, Sacros Lateran Ecclesias, Omnium... Uh, Ferris in Orbis, Ecclesium Mater et Caput. What that means, and uh, 
I did study a little bit of Latin, but I had to look this up just to be sure. It's saying that this church, this uh, St. John Lateran Church right there in Rome, is the mother and the head of all the churches in the city and in the world. And it is the sacred Lateran Church. Lateran is a wealthy family that had quite a number of buildings that they owned. Constantine said, no, I own them now. And he gave them to the Catholic Church. And so consequently, that church has been in existence uh, ever since then and claims to be the head of everything. Well, God has a different opinion. God is the head of everything. It's not this church. And it's not the place. The popes for over a thousand years had a palace there. And it was the Lateran Palace. That's where they lived. That's where they uh, had their headquarters. But that's not God's plan at all. Quite ornate, very beautiful, very attractive to people. But that's not God's plan at all. Many of the popes are buried in that church. You can walk around and see quite a number of the popes. Arthur Stanley says, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, titles from paganism. Constantine left all to the Bishop of Rome. The papacy is about the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon its grave. Well, there's people who objected. Uh, Wycliffe. Um, Martin Luther. What was the one before that? Oh, John Calvin. Uh, Martin Luther. We need God's word more than ever. God's word hasn't changed. It is the sword of truth. It determines life. And we need to listen to that God's word. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you. Help us to learn the lessons from each of these seven churches. And this church of Thyatira, which was growing in many areas, but was still permitting, still allowing um, the ways of the world, the pagan religions, to creep in and be a part of what we do. Father, may we be aware. May we be sensitive to understanding how the way of the world can take the place of you in our worship. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness, for your grace, for your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.